we all have our own ideas of what a hero should look like. We know what kind of person we want to show up when we have a need. Maybe you want that person to be tall and handsome and strong. You want them to have plenty of resources and cool gadgets, someone who knows how to use every weapon. Maybe even someone who could find just the simplest thing around you and make a weapon out of it if they need it. We all have an idea of what our hero should be. In the 21st century, we want to make sure that, that it's someone who is tech savvy, someone with a strong social media presence. I kind of long for the days when it was easy to tell who the heroes were. The hero always wore white. The white cowboy hat, white outfit, rode on a white horse. Wouldn't that be great to return to those days? Well, no, not, not really. Because many of us in this congregation would relate to a different sort of hero. We all have different ideas of what we're looking for when we want someone who will be there in the nick of time to save our bacon. We all have some kind of idea, but whatever your idea of what our hero is, we all have one thing in common, that desire to know that somebody will be there and bail us out if we get into trouble. All humankind was in deep trouble. We had a problem that we could not resolve for ourselves. A pandemic broke out and swept across the face of the entire planet, infecting every single person. With every person infected, languishing in our terminal disease that predetermined our fate, not just in this life, but also in eternity, we needed a hero. We needed a savior. Jesus comes on the scene to fill that role. But to be honest, when you come to the climax and the hero dies, your heart sinks. Fear soars and hope is lost. Jesus, the hero for which the world had long awaited, is unjustly charged, wrongfully convicted, hanging naked before the entire world. Not the stuff of heroes. While there was breath in his body, his faithful followers knew that they could at least pray that God would show up and do something miraculous, but then Jesus made it even worse. He gave up. He cried from the cross, It is finished! We might say today, I'm done. And it seemed like when he yielded up his spirit and he died, that the enemy had won. The battle was over. Jesus came to save the world, to set up God's kingdom on this earth. He was to be our heroes, our hero. But our dreams of a cure for the world's spiritual sentence came to an end when he died, or so it seemed. But there was something extraordinary something special, something completely not normal about Jesus' death. And the question I think we have to ask today is, even if Jesus were not the kind of hero we were looking for, is Jesus the kind of hero we actually all need? Because at exactly the same time as Jesus' death, there were three unexpected and unlikely extraordinary evidences that cause us to stop and ponder the life of this one named Jesus. And what was his death all about? Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. If you want to use one of the, the Bibles in front of you in the pew, um, you'll want to pay, turn to page 698. If you don't happen to own a Bible, uh, please feel free to take this as our gift. 
Matthew chapter 27, we'll start in verse 51. Again, that's page 698 in the Pew Bible. Three extraordinary evidences to the uniqueness of Jesus' death. Evidence number one is in verse 51. 51 says, And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook. shook. The rocks were split. Now the curtain separating that, that is talking about there is, is one that separated the holy place with the holy of holies. The holy place is where the priests did a lot of their stuff throughout every day. Now the holy of holies was a, a very special place. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was. Not the Indiana Jones one, but the real one. The Ark of the Covenant was in there. It was the presence of God. And nobody went in there except by special occasion. One time a year, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But what happened with this curtain, this veil, some translations say, is it was ripped in two from top to bottom. Now, the interesting thing about this is, is this was not just an important place. This was the most significant place. And when this curtain was ripped in half, it signified something so spectacular that humans, especially the Jewish people, could not have have begun to even fathom. See, the problem was, people, all people, including God's people, could not stand in God's presence. So imagine what it must have felt like for them to know that this curtain was wide open and God's presence was, was visible for everyone to see. It would have been terrifying for them. But God longed to have relationship with his people. This was not just any curtain. This curtain was elaborately woven fabric made up of 72 twisted plates of 24 threads each. That's really thick cloth. It was sturdy and it was 60 feet tall and 30 feet wide. Now imagine what it would take to rip this thing from top to bottom. That's how this massive curtain was torn. Not a feat that would be accomplished by human hands. But the importance of this miracle is far more significant than just ripping this spectacular piece of cloth. The significance comes in that when that curtain was separated, humankind, when that curtain was intact, humankind was separated from a holy, righteous, and perfect God. To be in God's presence requires that we be holy, righteous, and perfect. And there's not one among us today that can make that claim. Holy, righteous, perfect all the time. So the right hero, the right savior, would have to be holy, righteous, and perfect so that he could go into God's presence and leave the curtain open so that we could walk into God's presence as well. The book of Hebrews talks about what Jesus did on the cross when it says this. We have this sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. He moved into the holy of holies where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Jesus ripped that curtain in half. He proceeded into his Father's presence, providing a way for us to get in there so that we could come into his family. Through Jesus, our Savior, we have access to God. We don't have to go through a person. We don't have to go through ritual. We can simply go and talk with God. We can meet with God ourselves. Through Jesus, we have access to God. Even though we have access to God, we still have a problem. Because in, as individuals, we are still infected by this terminally, eternally terminal disease of sin. Something has to be done about that. Now, God inspired Moses to come up with this elaborate sacrificial system. They had a sacrifice for everything. 
They had you wash your hands for everything. They had different baths for everything because we wanted, they, they wanted to be holy, righteous, and perfect before God. The problem was, every time they did something wrong, every time they sinned, they had to make a sacrifice. And every time they did something wrong, the next time they had to make another sacrifice. Why? Because their sin wasn't taken care of. I mentioned earlier that one time a year, one person would go behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies where God's presence was. That one person was the high priest. Now, the high priest was only able to do that after they spent many days and hours purifying themselves, separating themselves from everybody else, wearing certain things, eating certain things, meditating on certain scriptures so that their mind was filled with thoughts of God and godly thoughts so that when they went into that holy of holies they would make a sacrifice they would sprinkle the blood on the altar first they made the sacrifice for themselves and then they made it for the entire nation but because they had to do that sacrifice every year it's called the day of atonement or Yom Kippur because they had to do that every year, it screams loud and clear that that sacrifice wasn't enough. A better sacrifice had to come along. A sacrifice from a lamb who was holy and righteous and perfect. So not only did Jesus open access to us, to, to God for us, he paid the price for our sins. That's why he hung on the cross. He shed his blood, dying in your place and mine, taking the penalty for your sin and my sin on himself when he hung on that cross. Hebrews 9.26 says, He sacrificed himself once for all, summing up all the other sacrifices in this sacrifice of himself, the final solution of sin. He continues on, he bypassed the sacrifices consisting of, of goat and calf blood. Instead, of using his, instead, using his own blood as the price to set us free once and for all. Through the Spirit, Christ offered himself as an unblemished sacrifice, freeing us from all those dead-end efforts to make ourselves respectable so that we can live all out for God. As human beings... We don't want something we haven't earned. And salvation is one of those things. We feel like if I'm, if I'm going to ask God to save my soul, I ought to I ought to be able to do something for that. I ought to earn it. But what this passage says is that all those efforts that you and I go to are worthless. We have to decide, am I going to rely on myself Am I the kind of hero I'm looking for? Am I the Savior that's going to be able to save me in the nick of time? Or am I looking for a Savior who can do something I can't? The holy, righteous, and perfect Son of God who sacrificed himself for you and for me. Through faith in Jesus, our Savior, we have access to God and we have forgiveness of sins. Now, the second extraordinary sign that we, or evidence that we see um, that kind of tells us there's something special happening in Jesus' death is an earthquake. Now, an earthquake is not really special. They happen all the time. They happen all over the world. There's probably one happening right now. Happily, not here. But, to time an earthquake to the precise moment when Jesus died, that's a pretty good miracle. That's pretty extraordinary. And, you know, this is something that happened 2,000 years ago. And I think sometimes we suspect that some things are in the Bible that are just kind of made up to make a point. You know, they make them larger than life. A lot of times we're, we're taught that it's myth and, and it's not really true, not really real. 
I found some historical confirmation for this particular earthquake in a couple of really odd places. First was a Jewish historian named Josephus. And second is a, a group of writings called the Talmud. Now the Talmud is a collection of, of Jewish rabbi teachings spanning about a 600 year amount of time. And in the Talmud, they teach their people how they're supposed to live the law, how they're supposed to abide by the law. Well, both of those resources say that about 40 years before Jerusalem was sacked, there was a massive earthquake that impacted the temple. Crazy, right? I also looked around to see if there was other attesting um, historical witnesses. Um, a Greek historian named Phlegon, who quoted, uh, was quoted by a, a century, a, excuse me, a second century historian, uh, Julius Africanus, and then a third century Christian historian named Eusebius. They all referenced this same earthquake. The earthquake, it says in verse 51, made the ground shake and the rocks split. Made the ground shake and the rocks split. Uh, it seems like a little bit of an odd earthquake. I grew up in Alaska, and I've been through earthquakes. Many of you have probably been through earthquakes in different parts of the world. I've never seen a rock split. I've been there where the, where the ground undulated. I've been there where things rose out of the ground that, that weren't there before. I've been there when things fell down that used to be there. But I've never seen a rock split. Maybe it's common. But it struck me as something that was a little bit out of the ordinary. But what resulted, and I think the point he's making, is that when that earthquake happened and those rocks split, the graves were opened. The graves were opened. Rather strange, interesting thing. And just as the curtain being ripped apart gives access to God to all, so when the graves were split open, it provided an opportunity for the next really strange and miraculous thing. The third extraordinary evidence is very unusual indeed. Verse 51 reads it this way. I think we have it on the screen. There we go. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Catch that? The tombs were open. The bodies of folks didn't just show themselves. These people got up and they walked around. Now, hold on to this for a second. It's very interesting to me that this is, and it's really only recorded in, in the, this one passage. But the third evidence of the uniqueness of Jesus' death is, is that people were raised from the dead. Now, it's, it's, it's intriguing to me that, that while Jesus was on the cross, he had opportunity after opportunity to save himself, but he did not. But through his death and his resurrection, he gave new life to anyone who would come to him by faith, and he gave kind of a hint of that by raising these people from the dead. Jesus said in John 12, 27, Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. He wouldn't accept deliverance for himself, but he provided salvation for, for others and life for these folks who got to come back. So, even though Matthew seems to tie this miraculous event to the death of Jesus, there's three little words in the middle of, of verse 53 that says this, after his resurrection. Now get this, here's the scene. Jesus is crucified. There's an earthquake. This earthquake is 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 terrifying. It's rattling the ground. Dishes falling off the wall. If they had 
plate glass windows, they would have been shattered, but they didn't. All these things are happening, and the rocks are splitting open. The graves are opening wide. So imagine that you have a loved one that's in the graveyard. You probably heard somebody saying, hey, the graveyard is a mess. Well, the Jewish people didn't want to go and walk among dead people because that would make them impure. But they, for the love of their loved ones, they went and they saw. And they realized, oh my goodness, look at this place. And so I can imagine that a family is sitting down with a stonemason and they're talking about what's going to happen and how they're going to fix this problem. And all of a sudden, someone's knocking at the door. And they open the door. And who do they see on the other side? They see grandma that they buried six months ago. They see Miriam. They see Esau. They see these people coming to their door. It's kind of intriguing to me. But the point may not be what you think. Jesus is a gracious, second chance giving Savior. Do you remember last week when we talked if, um, we talked about Jesus triumphal entry going into Jerusalem and all the people that came with him from outside Jerusalem were, were cheering and, and, and throwing down their, their cloaks and throwing down palm branches and saying Hosanna, Hosanna blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and they're cheering for him but we pointed out that the people that were cheering were not the people who lived in the capital city of the king Jerusalem they were not the people of Jerusalem and the priests and and, and the, the teachers of the law, they weren't praising God either. They were quiet. They had rejected Jesus. They were the ones who said, crucify him. They were the ones who nailed him to the cross. They did not want to hear from Jesus. So you know what Jesus did? Since they would not hear from him, he sent back to them people that they would hear from. People from their own families their own friends who would come back and say Jesus is raised from the dead that is spectacular they may not have believed in or seen Jesus resurrection from the dead but they saw at Miriam through faith in Jesus our Savior we have access to God we have the forgiveness of sins and we have the opportunity to have new life if we will put our faith and trust in him. And now, as this passage goes, we have a decision to make. Even if Jesus is not the Savior we've been looking for, could it be that he is the Savior that you and I and the whole world needs? Look at verse 54. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. A Roman centurion, a commander of a hundred Roman soldiers, had seen many, many crucifixions. To him and his team, it was just another day at the office. He had been there, done that, and got the muscle shirt. Nothing new for him. When the iron cleat of the Roman Empire came down on yet another charlatan's neck, they did not survive. And at first, that's what it seemed like to him would be the fate of Jesus. But he noticed that something was different. Had he heard of this from another centurion, he might have laughed it off, wondering if his colleague had been out in the sun too long. But he had no such, such luxury. He was an eyewitness from the very beginning in Pilate's court. He heard the absolute absence of damning evidence against Jesus. 
He smelled the jealousy oozing from the pores of the religious elite. As they moved the crowd to cry out, crucify, crucify. He lost respect for Pilate, who gave in to the political pressure to save his own hide. And he did as he was told, following his orders, along with his group of, of soldiers. They humiliated Jesus. They stripped him naked. They whipped him unmerciful, unmercifully and added to his, his humiliation by, by forcing him to carry his own cross to the place where they would nail him to it. The place where he would name, ne, uh, excuse me, hang naked before the whole world. Every man or woman under the Roman whip begged for mercy. They begged that they would end it soon. They, they would confess to anything, they, any charge they laid at their feet because they wanted it to be over. It was so excruciating. But the centurion noticed something different about Jesus. He was unfazed. It seemed as though he were doing this for someone else. He were doing this. He was doing this to protect someone else. The centurion caught a glimpse of some of Jesus' followers. They were lost. They were dejected. They were hopeless. Of course they were. That's the fate of every single person who comes up against the mighty Roman Empire. But then there was Jesus' mom. Jesus' mom was little more than an annoyance at first. She was everywhere. She was there from, from the time in Pilate's courtyard. She was there, underfoot, trying to see her son. She was there as he struggled down the road to Golgotha, to the, to the place where they crucify him. She was there, crying and wailing, mercy for my son. She stood at the foot of his cross, crying out for him, crying out for them to be merciful to him. She was there. But you know what he did? The centurion was shocked when he didn't cry out for himself for mercy like the two thieves on either side of him were doing. Instead, he looked down with compassion and he cared about his mom. He looked to one of his disciples who was standing nearby and he said, Son, here's your mother. He looked to his mom and he said, Mom, here's your son. His thoughts were not about himself. His thoughts were about others. His thoughts were about his mother. And his thoughts were about us. Criminals act like criminals. Many years dealing with the worst kind of human, human, human beings had taught this centurion not to expect anything more than the worst kind of base behavior from a prisoner. It was no surprise, even quite amusing, when at first both of the, the criminals who were crucified on either side of Jesus began to mock him and spit at him and curse him, spew hatred on him. But it didn't faze him. He didn't buy into the hatred. He didn't give it back. Then it got really interesting when one of those men changed. Why did he change? Did he have a flash of conscience? He didn't want to go out the way he had lived his life? Had he seen something in this man? Because that criminal looked to Jesus and he said, Forgive me. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now what would you do? What would I do? What would we do if somebody had just been spitting on us? Calling us all kinds of horrid names. Cursing us. And then a mere couple of hours later come to us and say, I'm sorry, will you forgive me? 
hopefully we'd forgive. But the Son of God never drank that Kool-Aid. He was always holy, righteous, and perfect. So that when that man asked, will you forgive me? His response shook the centurion to his core. Today, today you will be with me in paradise. He not only forgave the man who lived a horrible life, had been mocking him, spitting at him, cursing him, spewing hatred all over him for hours. He welcomed them to join him for all eternity. Who would do that? This man, Jesus, was unlike any other man the centurion had ever known. With all that he'd witnessed, from the trial, the betrayal of his own people, the cowardice of Pilate, the non-hateful way that he endured the malicious treatment that was generously poured out on him, unwilling to speak spitefully to anyone during any of this, and he hung, humiliated and dying on the cross, forgiving one thief, and then, in one of the other Gospels we read, that he said, Father, forgive them. Forgive the religious leaders. Forgive the, forgive the crowd that cried crucify. Forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. That is the kind of Savior we need. And when you add on top of that a 60-foot curtain ripped from top to bottom, an earthquake and the dead coming back to life, he may not have been the hero, the Savior we've been looking for, but he absolutely is the Savior that we need. There was something more than just special about this man. He was not just a hero. He was a Savior. And so the centurion came to this conclusion on his own. Truly, this was the Son of God. When Jesus said, it is finished, when he yielded his spirit and died, he was not admitting defeat. He was declaring victory, and the soldier there understood that. With all that he had done, Jesus did not falter from the path to sacrifice himself for me and for you, to be the Savior we need. A Savior who gives us access to God, provides forgiveness of our sins, and, and offers new life if we will simply come to Him by faith. Put your faith in Jesus. He is the Savior that you need. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. That veil was there to separate you from God because you and I are sinners. We have gone our own way. We have done things that are wrong. We know it in our own hearts. Whether it's something as small as, as stealing a cookie or something as big as cheating on our spouse, we know that we have sinned. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us is a sinner. But Jesus tore that curtain in half so that we could have access to God, have a relationship with Him through faith in Christ. So if we come to Him confessing our sins and asking Him to forgive us, He will bring us up to the throne room of God, make us His children, and give us new life in this world right now and in eternity. Now let me give you one little disclaimer. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, he's going to come into your life and he's going to change you. He doesn't want to have 50% of you. He doesn't want a seventh of you. I'll go to church on Sunday, the rest of the week is mine. He's saying, I have given everything for you and I'm going to require everything of you. So know that that's what he's asking as you come to this place. 
If you've already put your faith and trust in Jesus, now would be a great time to just praise God for the life you have. Praise Him for the gift He's given you. The, the songs we sing are all about what Christ has done for us and how He wants to work in each and every one of our lives. Let's pray again. If you'd like to put your faith and trust in Jesus, you can just talk to God yourself. Admit your sin. Ask Him to forgive you. Invite Him into your life. But if you'd like a little help, you can pray this simple prayer along with me. Pray it out loud. You can pray it to yourself. God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm far away from you. But I want to know you. Thank you that Jesus died for me. That his death paid the price for my sin. I put my faith and trust in what Jesus did for me right now. And I ask you to forgive me and to come into my life and make me a new person. Father, I want to thank you for the way you're working in each and every one of our lives. Help us to become more like you. Help us to honor you with our lives, honor you with our words, honor you with, with where we go and what we do. May we as a church grow to be a force for good in Golden and beyond by following you well. In Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, um, Levi's going to come and set up our offering. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus and you, and you want to talk to someone about that, or maybe you didn't yet and you've you got questions, please fill out one of those Connect cards and drop that in the, in the plate.